So we're, the end is near. I'm going to continue talking today about translation. And uh, for those of you who turned in uh, regrade exams, uh, they were back in the main office, so you can pick those up as you choose. And you should be set there. I will, uh, people have been asking about cards, when I'll bring cards in, probably later this week or early next week. I can tell you they're five by eight, so you can practice on a five by eight of your own if you want to. So. Same, as, same as last term. Okay. Uh, last time I got talking about uh, trans, uh, talking about um, accuracy in uh, translation, and that was pretty much where I finished. So I'm going to pick up today, talk about tRNAs, and then actually some steps in the translational process uh, itself, looking at it in a little bit more detail than you've probably seen in, in some other courses. A transfer RNA, if we were to take it and lay it out flat, would look like this. And I emphasize laying it out, making it look like uh, laying it out flat is the way it would look because transfer RNAs don't lay out flat. They're actually kind of folded up, as I'll show you in a second. Um, but the sort of two-dimensional schematic uh, is like this. We can see some base pairing going on, uh, stabilizing the helix. We see that it is, of course, one strand. It has a five prime end, and it has a three prime end. You remember from before that the three prime end has a CCA that is characteristic of a transfer RNA. It's to this three prime end where the amino acid becomes attached, um, and that is a critical step in the uh, overall process of translation. It's not a mechanism of making a protein, but it is a step in the overall process. Transfer RNAs, of course, carry the amino acid to the ribosome for translation. And it, at the ribosome, the uh, loop of the, and I should also have pointed that out, the loop of the transfer RNA called the anticodon loop, which is at the bottom of the previous uh, structure. The anticodon loop has a three nucleotide sequence that uh, pairs with a sequence in the messenger RNA. And if you look carefully at this, you'll see there's an I in there. I'll explain the significance of that I in a little bit. Um, but suffice it to say that the anticodon loop pairs with the codon sequence in the messenger RNA. A codon, of course, is a three nucleotide sequence. The genetic code is specified in three nucleotide sequences. Three nucleotides correspond to one amino acid, and I'll say more about that later. Now you can see the pairing that occurs uh, here. You see the I, in this case, pairing with a C. Okay? Notice that the transfer RNA pairs with the messenger RNA just the same way as we've seen all other nucleic acid pairings occurring, and that is anti-parallel. Notice that the messenger RNA on the bottom is going 5 prime to 3 prime from left to right, and the transfer RNA sequence is going from right to left as 5 prime to 3 prime. Okay? If the transfer RNA pairs properly with the codon, then the amino acid that that transfer RNA is carrying to the, be translated or to be made into protein is used. And if the wrong tRNA comes in here and pairing does not occur, then that tRNA is kicked out and uh, the ribosome waits for another one to come in. That sounds a little higgledy-piggledy. Again, remember at the nanoscale, these diffusion events happen very rapidly, much more rapidly than we see in the macroscopic world that we're in here. Even with the coming in and going out, the wrong things coming in and so forth, the average rate of translation is about 20 amino acids per second being made into protein. Okay? Well, if you remember when I talked about transcription, I said it was roughly 50 to 60 nucleotides a second. If we think about three bases per uh, amino acid, which is what we have in translation, then the rate of translation is approximately the rate of transcription. Approximately about the same. That's important in bacteria because in bacteria, the two processes are occurring together. In eukaryotic cells, it's not so much of an issue because transcription is occurring apart from translation. And there they just coincidentally run at about the same rates. <clears throat> That's general structure, same sort of thing there. There are names of the various loops based on things that they have in them. You see some other modified nucleotides in there. There's uh, pseudouracil, uh, which is what that symbol is there. There's uh, dihydrouracil uh, over here uh, in, in that loop. 
And of course, the anti-codon loop is down here. This variable arm is indeed variable. It varies from one transfer RNA to another transfer RNA. And um, I really won't say much more about that. The transfer RNAs typically have about 50 to 70 uh, nucleotides in them. There's the overall shape. So as I said, when we look at a transfer RNA in that sort of clover leaf shape, that's what it would be if we flattened it out. But we have to flatten it out to see that. The actual transfer RNA has a sort of a bent structure. And to orient you on this uh, structure that you're looking at, the anticodon loop is down here. So it can pair with the messenger RNA. And the amino acid attachment site is way up here, quite a, quite a distance away. That distance away turns out to be important for a process I'll be talking about in just a couple of minutes. I mentioned before there are some unusual bases that um, occur in transfer RNAs, modifications, etc. Again, we're not, not worried so much about structure or even names here, but just recognizing that there are different modifications that occur. Okay, so as I said uh, a minute or so ago, the, uh, there is a very <clears throat> critical step in the process of translation that most people take for granted. But without this step occurring properly, translation as we know it would not uh, be going on. And the step that is occurring is that the amino acid has to be put onto a transfer RNA. That's one important thing. So of course, if we don't put amino acids onto the transfer RNAs, they're not going to get carried to the ribosome. But even more important than that is the right amino acid must be put onto the right transfer RNA. So there's a sequence in the anticodon loop that is going to pair with the codon, you remember. And the codon specifies which amino acid it wants. It specifies it through that pairing with the um, anticodon, which means that the transfer RNA has to have the right amino acid paired with, uh, uh, I'm sorry, attached to it, corresponding to the anticodon that it has. So it's important then that there should be some accuracy in this process. I'm going to explain a little bit about that. The attachment of a, um, an amino acid to a transfer RNA is made possible by a set of enzymes known as amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Amino acyl tRNA synthetases. That's a mouthful of a name. Okay. They catalyze the reaction I'm going to uh, bring up on the screen right now. They catalyze a reaction that results in the formation of a bond between the, the transfer RNA, which is all shown in red. Here's that terminal A. Remember, we've got a CCA. Here's that A that's at the 3' prime end. And here's the attachment now to the amino acid. You'll notice that here's the ribose of that A. There's the adenine. That means that this is carbon number two. This is carbon number three. And we're going to see that some amino acids get attached to carbon number three. And some amino acids get attached to carbon number two. It's about even split, about 10 and 10. So some amino acyl tRNA synthetases put their amino acid onto position three. Some put it on position two. Now. The amino acyl tRNA synthetases are specific for each amino acid, meaning that there are 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, one for each amino acid. Now we will see later that there are multiple tRNAs for an amino acid in many cases. And that means that each amino acyl tRNA synthetase has to be able to recognize each of the different tRNAs that are possible for that amino acid. This is where the I's come in, and I'll explain the I's and how they actually reduce that number um, in a little bit. But suffice it to say that the amino acyl tRNA synthetase is specific for each amino acid. So I could have one for alanine, for example. I would have an amino acyl tRNA synthetase for alanine. It would put alanine onto its appropriate tRNAs. And there might be several different tRNAs for alanine that it could put on. And I'll, I'll show you that again in just a, just a minute. OK, so if this has happened properly, then we're, pre we're prepared for translation. Now, it is important uh, to recognize 
that I talked about accuracy last time. And accuracy is important. Accuracy is important not only during the synthesis of the protein, but it's also important in the putting on of the appropriate amino acid onto the appropriate uh, tRNA. And when we look at the uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetase, this figure doesn't show us very well. The next one I'll show you shows it schematically. We see something that looks like this. We see something called an activation site. And the activation site is the place where the amino, ace, where the amino acid is put on. The editing site is checking to see, is it the right thing? Okay. So this is where the quality control is done, and this is in the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So that blue, that little very light blue thing that you see right there is the enzyme that's catalyzing the formation of that bond. It flips out of the one side of the enzyme, goes into the other side of the enzyme, and the enzyme ensures that the right amino acid has been placed upon it. Okay. That's a pretty good complex right there. Now, if you remember, I, taught, I showed you a schematic representation of the three-dimensional structure of the tRNA. And so now you can see that sort of bent structure. Up here is where this amino acid is being not only put on, but also checked. There's the part of the enzyme. And here's another part of the enzyme that's reaching down and touching the anticodon. This is part of the quality control. Because with this quality control, if this enzyme reaches down and it finds the wrong anticodon sequence here, it will not put the amino acid onto that tRNA. It will only put an amino acid up here if part of the enzyme sends the message that you've got the right tRNA. Go ahead and put it on. Now, this is interesting and it's confusing. Okay? Well, it seems like it makes sense. One part of the enzyme is talking to the other part of the enzyme, and that's fine. Except for there are some enzymes, you're going to find this surprising. I found it surprising when I heard it, that don't reach all the way down here. They don't reach all the way down there. So how do they know if they've got the right tRNA or not? It's a question people have asked uh, a question pretty seriously, is that they can't reach here. How do they know? Well, it turns out there's other sequence information in many of the tRNAs in other places that actually flag the enzyme and tell it this is, in fact, the right tRNA. So tRNAs have different sequences internal to them, and in some cases, the, the uh, enzyme is recognizing those other internal sequences and not necessarily the anticodon loop. Okay, so if everything has occurred properly, we then see the amino acid, the right amino acid has been put onto the uh, tRNA. There are two classes of amino acyl tRNA synthetases in E. coli. And you see it's about 10 and 10, class 1 and class 2. They're classified by different classes for, for two reasons. One is they actually sit on the amino acid on different sides. One goes on what you can think of as the front side. The other class goes on what you can think of as the back side. And no, you don't need to memorize the table. The other reason for the basis of the classification is that the class 1 amino acyl tRNA synthetases all put the amino acid on position number 2 of that ribose. All of the class 2 enzymes put the amino acid onto position 3 of that ribose on the A at the end of the, of the transfer RNA. So 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3. Okay. All right, so that's the, the tRNA structure and, and uh, how that works. Uh, questions about that before I move on? Another quiet group today. I think they killed my real class and brought in a bunch of space aliens to substitute for them. Okay, bad joke, not even a joke. <clears throat> I know you're not my real class because you laughed at something that wasn't even a joke. I mean, the real class would not have done that, so I can tell. There are little certain signs that a professor always knows. All right, let's talk about ribosomes. Um, I talked about the fact that ribosomes um, have a sort of a snowman shape, and I still haven't shown you a snowman shape, unfortunately, because 
Um, as we know more about the structures, we realize that our schematics of big subunit and small subunit doesn't always translate real well, but it, I think organizationally as a snowman shape uh, sort of fits. A ribosome has about 50 to 70 proteins, and they're distributed across what are called the large subunit and the small subunit. Now, the way we used to talk about and teach translation, the way we taught about ribosomes was that every, all the important stuff was the proteins, and all that the RNAs did was they provided structural uh, components of the ribosome. And while it's true that we know today that the, RN, the ribosomal RNAs do, in fact, provide some structural uh, components to the ribosome, there are other functions we know today that they have. Now, I like this figure a lot because it actually shows the relative importance of the RNAs in these sequences. On this guy here on the left, the protein is shown in red. So you get an idea about how much the size of the big subunit is actually RNA. RNA is in the form of red here, and all, I'm sorry, in, in yellow and also in orange at the top. So the red is the protein that's in this guy. So it's equ at least equal in size, if not bigger, than the protein of the subunit. The major component, or a major component, of the large subunit is ribosomal RNA. Ditto the small subunit. In the small subunit, the protein is colored in blue. An awful lot of green on this guy, and the green relates to one of the ribosomal RNAs. Now, the ribosomal RNAs are distributed. The, the uh, 23S, which is the name, which is the largest, the, the S refers to the Svedberg value, in case you're curious. The uh, 23S relates to the largest of the ribosomal RNAs. The 23S and the 5S, which is the little tiny one up here shown in orange, are in the 50S subunit. The uh, 16S ribosomal RNA is what's in the 30S subunit. And as you look at this, you probably wonder if biochemists can't do math because 50 plus 30 does not equal 70. But Svedberg units are not at strictly additive. So 70 is larger than 50 or 30 but it's also the sum of the two when you uh, measure in a centrifuge. So don't get hung up on the math component of it. Okay? So the overall, this, and we're, by the way, we're talking here about a prokaryotic ribosome. Eukaryotic ribosomes are larger. In the case of a eukaryotic ribosome, we have a 60S unit, we have a 40S unit, and we have uh, an 80 or 90S unit, depending on how you measure it. Okay? We have the largest ribosomal RNAs in the large subunits, like we saw in the prokaryotic, and we have a smaller, one of the smaller ones in the small subunits. So organizationally, eukaryotic ribosomes are very, very similar to that of prokaryotic ribosomes, and functionally, we'll see they are as well. Another thing to point out here is the fact that if we look at the interface between the large subunit and the small subunit, we see that almost all the interactions are between RNAs. So RNAs are not only providing structural integrity, they're also providing some interaction to help hold the structure together. <coughs> Ribosomal RNAs are pretty odd and fascinating things. If we take a ribosomal RNA and we flatten it out, like we flatten out that transfer RNA, we see something that looks like this. Now, look at this guy. This guy is one strand. This is the 16S ribosomal RNA. Okay? The 16S ribosomal RNA. And look at the possible pairings and the unusual shape that we see inside of this guy. This basic scheme of pairing is conserved, meaning that it's basically the same no matter what type of cells we're looking at. If we look in eukaryotic cells, we see a similar structure. If we look in prokaryotic cells, we see a similar structure, even though the sequences themselves may vary. And in fact, they do vary. This tells us that this structure is very, very important. Very, very important. And that's not surprising. What did we learn about proteins? Structure implies function. Structure implies function. If we disturb the structure, we disturb the function. And since we're talking about making protein, if we're messing with, with making protein, we're going to kill the cell. So it's not surprising that we see similar structures occurring from one organism to another. 
It turns out that the sequence itself isn't nearly as important as the structure is. Let's say, for example, I see, look at this, I've got a bunch of base pairs here. In this particular one, this might be reading C, 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 C on the top, G, 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 just as a simple example. I could take another cell and I could change this where I have A, 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 T, 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 okay? I still have the same structure because I have base pairing going on, and that would probably function. So the sequence of the ribosomal RNA is not important. It's the structure that matters. And this is true for all of the ribosomal RNAs. The structure is what's key. Now, the colors up here are a little hard to see, but if you look at the colors, they're actually mapped onto a three-dimensional plot of this blob that we see down here. When I look at those ribosomal RNAs, the first thing that comes to my mind is globular protein. Globular proteins fold, right? We have a long linear sequence of amino acids, but they fold and give us a three-dimensional structure that looks like a glob. This guy looks like a glob. Okay? And what we're going to see is that ribosomal RNAs have functions like proteins do as well. So that globular structure really does have some importance for the function of a ribosomal RNA. Okay, well let's get away from structure for the moment and think back to sequences again. Okay? Let me just tell you a problem. Here's a problem. Bacteria have what we call polycystronic messenger RNAs. Anybody remember what that means? Multiple genes on a single messenger RNA. Okay? Now, if we have multiple genes on a single messenger RNA, that means we have to have a, a specific place where the first gene starts to be translated and then a place where it stops. Then the question is, where does the next one start? Okay? The start sequence is an AUG. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a little bit. It's called the initiation codon. And that initiation codon is present throughout the, the um, gene or the, the, the cluster of genes without the, throughout the messenger RNA. How does the cell know which AUG to start at, either for the first one or for the second gene or the third or whatever? Well, it turns out in prokaryotic cells, and by the way, prokaryotes are the only ones that have multiple genes on a single messenger RNA. In prokaryotic cells, the problem is solved in a very interesting fashion. It's solved with the assistance of the 16S ribosomal RNA. So the 16S ribosomal RNA plays a very important role in what I'm getting ready to describe to you here. What this figure shows is an alignment of the initiation codon of a whole bunch of different proteins. You notice one of them starts with a GUG, and that's also known in prokaryotic cells in rare cases, that it can start with a GUG. Okay. They've all been aligned, and we look upstream, we look ahead of this, and notice we're looking in the RNAs now, not the DNAs. We're looking in the messenger RNA. We're looking for sequences that might be similar between them. And what they've tried to do in this figure, they could have picked a little, some better examples, but what they've tried to show you in this figure is that there is, in fact, a relatively common sequence. And the consensus of this uh, overall is that this sequence, GGAGG, is the most common, when we look across hundreds of genes, that occurs about 10 nucleotides away from the translational start site. Notice I said translational start site, meaning that this sequence is in the RNA. It's different from a promoter. The promoter was in DNA, and the promoter sequence never makes it into the RNA. This sequence is in the RNA, and this sequence forms a base pair region with the 16S ribosomal RNA. So there's a sequence in the 16S ribosomal RNA that is complementary to this, and that helps to align the messenger RNA with the start site in the ribosome. This sequence has a name. It's called the Shine Delgarno sequence. Shine Delgarno, S-H-I-N-E. D-A-L-G-A-R-N-O. The Shine Delgarno sequence helps to align the messenger RNA with the ribosome so that translation starts at the right place. This sequence is actually telling the ribosome, 
Here is where the start codon is. We do not see shine delgarno sequences in eukaryotic cells, partly because we don't have to. Eukaryotic cells only have one protein per messenger RNA that's made. And in eukaryotic cells, usually the first AUG is the one that's used. In prokaryotic cells, that may not be the case. We may see multiple AUGs ahead of there. Here's an AUG right here. Okay? So the first AUG is the one that's used in eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, they use the shindo garno sequence to tell the ribosome where to start translation. Okay. Uh, now, another oddity about prokaryotes and translation. There are 20 amino acids that make it into proteins. There are a couple of minor exceptions, and I won't be talking about them here. But one of the amino acids that makes it into prokaryotic proteins is uh, a modified amino acid. It's chemically modified. And it's modified only for the very first one. Okay. The first amino acid that makes it into every prokaryotic messenger R I'm sorry, into every prokaryotic protein is a methionine. Eukaryotes also start with methionine. So that's common between the two. The difference is that the methionine that makes it into the very first amino acid of proteins of prokaryotes. Editorial comment up there. Okay. Uh, the very first one that makes it into the, uh, pro the uh, amino terminus of prokaryotic proteins has a formyl group put onto it. It's just this little carbon with double bond oxygen shown here. When we look at other methionines that make it into prokaryotic proteins, they don't have that. Only the very first one has that. So we call this first amino acid formyl methionine linked to a tRNA or as it's oftentimes called, just FMET, or FMET tRNA. Not good. What's that? My phone? Does it? Well, we'll see about that. I'll tell you when it's off. We'll see. Whoa, it's not off yet though. No? Come on. Oh, come on, it turned you off. There we go. Well, maybe. No, no. Nice try. Okay. Anyway, well, I think it's ET. You know, the ET is sitting in on our lecture here. All right. Uh, so there's a specific enzyme that does this. It's called a transformylase. Um, and what it does is it simply takes a formula group. Here's another folate. Remember the folates from the um, nucleotide biosynthesis? Here's a folate that's transferring that single carbon residue to this. This modification does not occur in eukaryotic cells. And you might wonder why the modification occurs at all. And the modification occurs to prevent a side reaction from occurring in the formation of the first peptide bond. It turns out that in prokaryotes, their ribosome doesn't protect the uh, methionine in the same way that our ribosomes protect that. Our ribosomes will not allow a side reaction to occur. However, prokaryotic ribosomes, if this FMET was not there, would allow that side reaction to occur and would destroy protein synthesis in the organism. So this modification is necessary to allow translation to continue in prokaryotic cells. Okay, moving along here. Now we look, go back to structure and we look at the ribosome and we, I point out something I pointed out to you previously, that is that there are three places inside of the ribosome where we actually can bind transfer RNAs. They're shown here in yellow, red, and sort of brownish. Okay? There's a progression of uh, transfer RNAs through these sites. When we, do, when we start the very first amino acid, the very first transfer RNA, we're initiating translation, the very first one gets put into the P site. And then as we shall see, all of the new ones that come in come into the A site. 
And so what happens in the process of translation is the ribosome moves along a messenger RNA from left to right, and things that are in the A site move to the P site, things that are in the P site move to the E site, and things that are in the E site exit the ribosome, which is why it's called the E site. Okay? And I'll show you some uh, close-up detail on how that goes. But that's the layout of those three sites inside of the ribosome. Okay, your book in this chapter is very higgledy piggledy. They jump all around, which is why you're seeing, if you just copy the figures straight out, that the, 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 the uh, images do vary. The genetic code. We all hear about the genetic code, and I think most of us have a pretty good handle for what this is. The genetic code specifies the relationship between the three nucleotide sequence in the, the uh, messenger RNA and a specific amino acid on the tRNA that pairs with it. Okay? I'll repeat that. The genetic code specifies the relationship between a three nucleotide sequence in the messenger RNA and the amino acid on the tRNA that pairs with it. Okay? So if I said, here's the codon, and by the way, these are what we're seeing here are codons. Sorry. Yeah, hi, Rod. This is Kevin in Gilfillan. Um, the, there's a very annoying uh, electronic uh, feedback noise that's happening in the classroom here, and I can't seem to make it go away. I think it's, coming from, I think it's as a result of the wireless microphone. Yeah. You guys might wish to just be aware of it, okay? All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay, I'm going to turn that off and just speak loudly. Hopefully it'll go away. Can you hear me back okay? Okay. All right, so here's the genetic code. Shh. All right, three nucleotide sequence that corresponds to the amino acid and the transfer RNA that pairs with it. Now, first thing we see in looking at the genetic code is there is what we call redundancy. Redundancy means that each amino acid, that an amino acid has more than one sequence that corresponds to it. Most amino acids have more than one codon that can specify them in the messenger RNA. Not all of them. For example, if we look at methionine, wherever it is on here, a, and the way you read this is A, U, and then G. So A, U, and then there's a G down here. The only codon that specifies methionine is A, U, G. Okay? So methionine's coding is not redundant, but if we compare that to the coding for valine, valine is redundant because it's got four here, and if we look more around, we see valine also appearing... I thought we had six in valine. Mm, no, we don't. Okay. Well, we do have six. We do have six for leucine. Here's four here, and plus two more up here. So some can have as many as six different codons that specify them. Now, if we look at these sequences closely, what we see is that, in this case of valine, it's specified by GUU, GUC, GUA, GUG. You see a pattern. G, you are kidding, right? G, you, that was a joke. <laughs> see, this is not my, really my class, okay? My class would be laughing hilariously at this if, if you were really my class. So I shall have to re, re, put that in. The aliens have come and, got, come and got you. I think that now I have evidence. The, the electronics are going and everything. All right. Well, when we compare all of these, here's alanines. Uh, what is this? Uh, GCU, GCC, GCA, GCG. We notice that the place where they vary is in the three prime position for the most part. Okay? And so we could specify valine as GUX, where X is any of the nucleotides in this case. Make sense? Okay? That means that if we mutate the third base, and the third base was for something that coded for valine, there would not be a change in the protein sequence for valine. However, if I mutated the third base of methionine, if I went from a G to a C, I would change from methionine to a leucine, isoleucine. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Now, this redundancy allows the cell to use some shortcuts in making 
the transfer RNAs that have the anti-codon. Because in doing so, what cells are doing is cheating on base pairing. The cell doesn't want to have to make a transfer RNA that pairs with a this, which would be a CAC plus a UAC plus a GAC, etc. Okay? The cell doesn't want to have to make four of these. What if it could only make one or two? And it does that by cheating with the base pairing rules that I'm going to show you. Now, one last term I want to give you, though, at this before I move on, and that is that this third position, which is quite variable, has a name. It's called the wobble position. The wobble position means that that part of the codon is variable. It can vary without great consequence for the most part. Again, there are exceptions, but for the most part, that third position can wobble without a problem. If I compare that sequence to the anticodon, where is the wobble position? 5 prime or 3 prime? It's at the 5 prime end because this is at the 3 prime end of this one, right? Okay. Let's take a look at how cells cheat. They cheat by using inosine. Inosine, where have we seen inosine before? Nucleotide metabolism, it was the branch point between A and G. If you recall, we had IMP, that was the branch point. Okay. Inosine gets into transfer RNA as a result of modification that happens. Inosine has the ability to pair, to form stable base pairs with C and U and A. So now, if the cell puts an inosine at the wobble position, it only has to make one transfer RNA to handle three different codons. That's efficient. Okay? The cell doesn't have to make as many different transfer RNAs if it uses inosine. Another base that hap that okay, so here's here's the, the some of the base pairs that you can see. Again, structure isn't important, but inosine cytosine, or cytidine, uh, inosine uridine, inosine adenosine. And we can see those um, arrangements happen, and these are stable arrangements that happen um, as a result of that. Another, in RNA, we discover there's another stable base pair that can happen that cannot happen in DNA. And that is a GU base pair. G and U are not unstable. Okay? So that gives even more flexibility in what the cell puts into that transfer RNA. It allows the cell to make fewer transfer RNAs so that they will have stable bonds between the anticodon and the codon. Okay. Let's see. Another function, I've already given you one function for the 16S ribosomal RNA. One of the functions I gave you was it has a sequence complementary to the shine dogarno sequence in the messenger RNA so that it helps to align the messenger RNA for translation initiation. Another function that the 16S ribosomal RNA has is that it ensures that the right codon anticodon pairing is occurring. It's another quality control to make sure that the right transfer RNA is in at the A site so that the ribosome can do its thing. Okay. Now, let's talk about a little bit about mechanism. I'll try to keep it simple. And when we look at how does a ribosome get to have the shape and structure that it does, what we discover is there's an orchestrated set of events that builds that big ribosome on a messenger RNA. So the ribosome is literally built on the messenger RNA. Okay. We can see here that there are proteins called initiation factors. They're called IF. There's IF1, IF2, IF3. Okay? IF1 and IF3 form a complex with the small subunit in the first step. Then a messenger RNA, an FMET tRNA, and a third initiation factor, IF2, come together 
and combine with the first complex. So we make a structure that looks like this guy. Notice that IF2 is a G protein. You heard G proteins last term. You saw G proteins playing a role in signaling. Now you see G proteins playing a role in translation. G proteins, I'll remind you, are proteins that bind guanine nucleotides. And they cleave guanine nucleotides during their process of acting. And we'll see how these guys do it here. Translation is full of G proteins. In fact, all of the energy of translation occurs by the cleavage of GTP. No ATP is used in translation. Only GTP. OK, so here's our complex. We see all these guys together. Notice that this has been arranged so that that FMET tRNA is base paired with the AUG. And if we think about the A, the P, and the E site, even though we don't have the top unit there, the bottom part of it still corresponds to A, P, and E, we see that the initiator tRNA has been placed into the P site. It's the only tRNA that comes into the P site. Next, we see the leaving. After this stable complex is formed, we see the leaving of the first two initiation factors, IF1 and IF3. And if, when the 50S subunit comes in, the IF2 gets out of the way. It cleaves the GTP within it and allows the proper positioning of the two subunits together. So, the cle so when everything is all fine and dandy, IF2 cleaves its GTP releasing GDP, IF2 goes away, and the 50S is paired properly with the 30S, and we have finished the initiation phase of translation. OK, a lot of mouthful there. I'll slow down and let you catch up. Questions about that? Yes, Megan. How does the small subunit know where the AUG is? Because the small subunit, it's a good question, is the one that has the 16S ribosomal RNA, and it has, it has paired that portion of its 16S ribosomal RNA with the messenger RNA, and when it does that, that places this guy in the P site. Does, does it just bind somewhere and slide along until, until it finds it? And the answer is basically yes. But once it has found that, then that places the AUG right there in the P site where it's supposed to be. Carl? Is this uh, the same for prokaryotes and eukaryotes? This is basically the same for prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are slightly more complex, not overly more complex, but the same basic process happens. And I won't, I won't show you a different process for eukaryotes. You can relax about that. Yes? Oh, here, this is, well, this is uh, actually IF1 uh, and IF3 up here, yeah. Yes, uh, Jenny. Is there any specificity to what the ribosome can translate? Can any ribosome translate any mRNA? Is there any specificity to what the ribosome can translate? It's a good question. Uh, in general, the answer is yes, it can translate. But we do see an efficiency of pairing with the shine Delgarno. So again, if we have sequences that are very far off that shine Delgarno, they're not going to translate very efficiently because they're not going to bind properly. Just like, kind of like we saw with the transcription factors that couldn't bind that cognate sequence in the, in the right way either. Okay? So there are some efficiency differences that we see as a result of changes in the shine Delgarno sequence. But in general, the answer is yes, you can translate anything that you throw at it. OK, moving on. We finished the initiation phase. Let's go to the elongation phase. And in the elongation phase, we're now going to make our first peptide bond. Okay, Our first peptide bond. Notice that when we've got a close-up now of this, we see that here's that first tRNA, and there's that very first FMET right there. We see nothing in the A site yet. What we see is incoming amino acyl tRNA. 
and it's going to come into the A site and form base pairs with the codon that is in the A site. This amino a ACL tRNA that's coming in is being carried by an elongation factor. So in this phase of the process, we see the involvement of elongation factors. The elongation factor that is carrying this amino acid is called elongation factor TU. It's called EFTU, or as we commonly call it, EF2. But it's not the number two, it's TU, EFTU. EFTU turns out to be the most abundant protein in all of E. coli. Now, that tells us, first of all, that translation is important. There's a second reason why it's important. I'm not going to tell you today, but I'll tell you in the lecture on Wednesday. EFTU helps to ensure not only that it's bringing this uh, transfer RNA in, but it also makes sure that the base pairing out here is proper. Okay, so we saw the 16S ribosomal RNA was involved in that. We now see EFTU is also involved in making sure that the right tRNA is in at this site. If EFTU has brought in the right one and base pairing is appropriate, then EFTU will cleave its GTP, it's a G protein also, release GDP and leave. If it's brought the wrong one in, that is, it doesn't form the right base pairing down here, then EFTU will take its tRNA away and let another one come in. So EFTU is part of that quality control process. The next step of the process, we see the peptide bond being formed. Notice we have the two little balls up here. Notice over here that both balls are on the second tRNA. A peptide bond has happened, and here's the cool thing. The peptide bond is formed as a result of catalytic action of the 23S ribosomal RNA. Here's a ribozyme. This was discovered after the other ribozymes were known. People had suspected this was the case, but it wasn't proven until later. All the peptide bonds on the face of the earth are made as a result of catalysis by RNA. That's kind of cool. OK, the rest of this is now simply moving things around. The next step is called translocation. I'll say more about it next time. It involves another elongation factor called G, or EFG. EFG is also a G protein. It cleaves GTP and slides the ribosome. Okay, Actually, it slides the ribosome this way. I'm sorry. It's sliding the ribosome this way so that now what was in the A site is in the P site. What was in the P site is in the E site. And we're ready for another round of elongation. Questions? Yeah. So what's happening, okay, in the elongation phase is elongation factor G is a G protein. It's using the energy from the cleavage of GTP to move the ribosome one more space over and kick this guy that was here over to here, the blue one over to here, and we're back to where we started. Okay, I think it would be appropriate to finish with a song today. I have a perfect song for this point. If you guys will stand and put your hands on your heart, please. That's, that's important here. Trust me. Trust me. This is the national anthem of biochemistry. Hands on your hearts. Very easy song to sing. Everybody, I want to hear you loud today, okay? Let's let the last, next, next class know that we're really fun or something. I don't know. Okay. Oh, beautiful with RNA that makes the peptide bonds. You hold tRNA so it can pair up with codons. The ribosome, the ribosome, translate mRNA. From star to UGA. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure.